Good afternoon to you in South Africa. I hope you're all doing well. I know it's pretty tough out there in lockdown. Um, we're about three and a half weeks into our lockdown over here, so I have a lot of sympathy for the way that you must be feeling right now. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just before we get underway, I had a couple of very quick announcements to make. One of them is that um, you'll notice on your screen that there is a Q&A um, uh, panel. And what I'm asking you to do is, as, you go as I go through the webinar and you think of specific questions, please note them down in the Q&A and I will uh, make time at the end to answer um, your questions. Um, and obviously, if there are repeats of the same question, I'll just answer the general question. So look, um, this is a bit like a speed dating exercise. I have 30 minutes. There's a lot I want to tell you, and I want to really kind of keep you completely um, engaged and, uh, and amused. So we'll get right into it if we can. So remember, all your questions in the Q&A chat box, in the Q&A panel, and anything else in the chat box, but I will not answer questions on the chat box, just on the Q&A panel. Right, I'm going to share my screen now, and I'm going to tell you that today what we're going to do is we're going to cover a number of topics. Um, we're going to do so in, uh, in, in, in fairly quick time. I'm going to start off by talking about the brain in crisis um, and what this means to be in a crisis situation like we all are in at the moment. We'll talk a little about how we think. We'll talk about then how we think in a crisis which is um, clearly just applying what the brain does in a crisis to the thinking issue. Um, I have a guest interview with a colleague and a really impressive strategic marketing um, fellow by the name of um, Ashton Bishop. We'll look at a case study on the work that I've been doing and I'll end up with some practical steps, things that you can take away and, uh, and use in your day-to-day -day lives from tomorrow. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning and say to you that um, one of the things that's really important to understand about the brain is that the brain, although it's a very complex organ made up of so many different parts, it actually has an overall goal. There's one overall goal, aim, if you like, that the brain has, and that is to keep us safe from danger. So the brain's major goal is to minimize threat and to maximize reward. But here's the kicker. There are five times more threat circuits in our brain than there are reward circuits. So essentially what this means is that we're far more inclined to move away from danger than we are to move towards reward. So you might just say we are all inherently conservative and our whole strategy in any decision making is to minimize the downside rather than to maximize the outside. And this is a, a fairly important insight which classical economics doesn't necessarily take into account. Now, when you look at the brain, and I'm going to keep it really simple here, there, there really are two important parts that are worth taking account of. There's the limbic system, which is the older part of the brain, and that controls all the non-conscious activities in the brain, things like breathing and temperature regulation, your stomach and so on. But it also is the part of the brain that looks after your feelings and your emotions. The things that you have little control over, but generally affect your behavior significantly. Then there's a new part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which generally develops at about age 20 in women and about age 25 in men. It's the smart part of the brain. It's a part of the brain that can make judgment, manage risk, and, and really think logically and analytically. And I'm going to use a Star Wars analogy to try and describe how the two parts work. So if you're familiar with Star Wars, you'll know that two of the key characters in Star Wars were Darth Vader. He, the black giant warrior who actually carries this red stick, this red lightsaber. And Darth Vader's whole approach is based on the fact that he's experienced, he's strong, he has a very, very high level of energy and stamina. He's a real fighter and a warrior. But his responses are fairly simplistic. He either moves away from danger or towards, towards reward. And he makes decisions very, very quickly based on, based on this overall human instinct 
to protect us from danger and to maximize our reward. The prefrontal cortex is perhaps best described by Luke Skywalker. Now, Luke Skywalker is a young, highly intelligent, very clever warrior, but he's still learning his craft. He doesn't have the stamina or the strength or the staying power that Darth Vader does. And he, he needs a lot of consumption of, of food or glucose to keep him going. So you'll find that during the day, Luke Skywalker gets hungry or tired and he then goes to sleep. He checks out. And when that happens, Darth Vader kicks in. So you've got these two parts of the brain who are waging a war. It's not about good versus evil, but it's rather about which part of the brain will really manage the decision-making process. So given that, when you are faced with a particular situation, the little eye over there is, is an input. It refers to anything that might happen, any event, anything you see or hear. You have two responses. You have a reflexive response, which is fast and automatic, such as where you see the red traffic light or robot, as you'd call it. Um, you don't think about it. You just hit your foot on the brake pedal. The car stops. Or you touch something hot, you move your hand away from it very quickly. Or the reflective mode, where you actually pause and take a considered view about what's going on and kind of think about things. So these are the two primary responses that we tend to have. And given that the limbic system has far more processing capacity than the PFC, Darth Vader tends to operate far more as the default system in your brain. Now, what does this mean for thinking? It means essentially we have three types of thinking. There's the reflexive type of thinking, which I've, as I've already said, is a very subjective form of thinking, which simply says, what are my needs? What are my preferences? And what are my habits? All those things are done non-consciously. They're what we might call scripted responses. And then on the green side, the more reflective approaches, we have analytical focus. And the analytical focus is where you sit down in a logical way and work your way in a systems perspective on what's really going on. You look at the problem from different angles and you work out from a logical perspective what is needed to be done. But there's another third thinking process. And that's what we sometimes call an elastic thinking process or the insight process. The insight process is non-conscious. It processes information in a non-linear way and combines multiple threads of thought in order to kind of come to this flash of insight that I'm sure you've all experienced from time to time. Now, there's one critical thing that I have to point out here, and that is that while analytical thinking, the logical perspective takes place when you are focused and concentrated and really immersed in the data and the information before you, the insight process occurs when you step away from the data when you move away from the problem or the challenge or the information that you're trying to process, when you go for a walk, when you're kind of listening to music, or when you're doing something completely different in the shower, reading a story to your kids. So the insight process is actually quite different. And what it does do is it produces what we often call the creative thoughts that are so important in any strategy process. So you have analytical thinking and insight thinking. Now, I'm going to take those two concepts and I'm going to ask the question of how we think. How do we think and how do we think strategically? Now, we know that strategic thinking really has three kind of phases. The first phase on the left hand side is when we try to identify what's going on. So what's happening? What's the problem? What are our customers saying? What's our market share? What's happened to our profitability? And that's an analytical phase where we actually identify the facts. Then there's an insight phase where we take the facts and we kind of group them and regroup them. And we, we try to boil them down and essentially ask ourselves, well, yeah, yeah, I've got all the facts, but what does it actually mean? And we really mull over it and we reflect on it and kind of try to really see this information in different ways. And when we figured out what it means, we move into the third phase, which is again an analytical phase, and we figure out what are we actually going to do here. So what's interesting is that you move from analysis to insight to analysis. And that is 
strategic thinking. Now, what's really important about this is to recognize two things. The first is when you're in a hurry, when the organization or you are operating at high speed, when you're in what we often call an action mode, which so many companies like to call themselves, they like to say we're an action oriented organization. What generally tends to happen is we miss out that middle phase. We go straight from what's going on, what are we gonna do? What's going on, what are we gonna do? And as you can see, by missing out the inside phase, we don't particularly get very insightful, creative, or indeed strategic answers. So that's the first thing that happens when, or the first thing that disturbs this natural kind of phase one, phase two, and phase three. The second thing that actually renders insight less effective, in other words, that causes you to move straight from what's happening, what are we gonna do, is when you are in a crisis situation or a situation of stress. So when you're in a situation of stress, essentially what happens is Luke Skywalker doesn't necessarily do such a great job. And we tend to operate much more reflexively. So we tend to operate, if you like, without necessarily thinking, but based on instinct and some of our scripted responses. Lessons we may have learned in the past, things that are really driven by our own innate fears or our own preferences or our own habits. So we choose the path that we've chosen before, which generally tends to work. So one of the things we need to realize is that a crisis generally, unless we manage this very carefully, a crisis generally means that we aren't thinking very strategically. We have a saying over here that in a crisis, people run around like chooks with no heads or like a chicken with no head. They just run around and it's all action, 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 trying to do things, trying to put out fires. And you aren't necessarily taking the time to develop insight and develop strategic answers to what you might have to, as an option to do. Now, where that really takes us is in fact a really interesting place as far as strategy is concerned and strategic thinking is concerned. And, and this is often a factor that people tend to forget, that the framework you use to make decisions, the framework that you use to set strategy, the framework that you use to solve big problems and challenges you have are like an invisible hand. They're kind of like a puppet master. Now, what that really means is actually something quite strange. It means that the choice of your strategic framework will to a large extent shape the outcome that you're going to achieve, even if you didn't want that outcome. So if you use an inappropriate framework, particularly in times of crisis or when you need to think strategically in times of uncertainty, you're not going to get the right answer. And I'll just say straight up that while we do talk about this a lot more on our, um, on our program, our three-day program of scenario planning and strategic thinking, I will just say that if you're still using SWOT analysis and decision tree analysis at this point in time, you're absolutely using the wrong tool to help you think through the creative strategic insights that you need to deal with a crisis situation. And why do I say this? Well, I say this because we need to understand that the environment we're in at the moment is what we might call a complex system. And there's a big distinction here between what we call complicated systems and complex systems. Complicated systems are where there is one right answer, where you can apply a particular formula or algorithm or one particular best practice way to solve the problem. So that's where you can use analysis. So if you're an engineer, there is actually a way to build a bridge. You measure the stress, you measure the loads, you measure the winds, you measure how many kind of cars it needs to carry, and there's a right answer. In a complex system, so, so in a complicated system, then just going back to that first one, the cause drives the effect. There's a relationship between what you do and the effect. If you design the bridge poorly, it'll fall down. If you design it well, it'll work. So there's a almost a linear relationship between cause and effect. In the case of a complex system, one cause has multiple effects. So a complex system means that there are multiple points of view that exist 
around this particular challenge. And those points of view are generally driven by political, social, and cultural perspectives. So it's, you know, it's a situation like you're dealing with at the moment. The economists have got one angle that they want to pursue, the psychologists and mental health professionals another, the medical experts of another. There is no one right answer. One cause has multiple effects. Now, in complex situations, as you stand today in the present, you don't face a future. You face multiple futures because you've got all these uncertainties. And as these uncertainties interact, as these variables interact with each other, different futures will emerge. And because of that, you need a very different form of strategic thinking to deal with complexity. You cannot simply use the straight line approach, which says, let's actually set an objective into the future, and then let's actually work out how we're going to get there. Because if you simply do that, which is conventional planning, what you're actually doing is you're predicting the future. You say, let's set an objective, and that objective assumes certain conditions in the environment. It assumes a particular future, and that's not going to work. So what we generally tend to do in those situations is we recognize that there are multiple futures, and each future then has a different set of conditions which we need to understand and prepare for. And so the process of scenario planning, rather than trying to predict which future will occur, does something else. It simply says, what are the capabilities we might need for each of those futures? So the focus doesn't sit on thinking about which future will exist. It simply says, what capabilities do I need if any of those futures exist? And then instead of forecasting what's going to happen, we backcast. We say, well, if those are the capabilities that exist in the future, what does that mean we have to do today? And once we've done that, we can then see quite ironically, and this happens very, very often, that about 30 to 40% of those capabilities that we seem to require in each of those futures actually are common. And so we set about building those common capabilities right now. That gives us a plan of action and we can actually then move our way towards the future. So the emphasis is not on predicting the future, but it's on building the capabilities that are really needed to help us navigate the future and a wide range of futures. All right, so what I'm gonna do at this point in time is introduce a colleague of mine, Ashton Bishop, who runs an organization called Step Change. I interviewed him and he does a seven minute video here about strategic thinking, which I'm thinking and hoping you will find very interesting and maybe nice to see a different face rather than mine. But Ashton's a really effective and creative marketing strategist. He's worked on billion dollar brands around the world. He's a serial entrepreneur, has formed and run successfully many companies. You'll find him very challenging, very controversial, but he's always focused on results. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a short video and we'll listen to Ashton's views about the world. Off you go, Ashton. Hi, Norman. So, we're looking at what happens with strategic decision making, and I think. I'll probably draw that strategic decision making versus tactical decision making because you know I've spent probably the last 10 years working with clients in change. So my business has been called Step Change, and I've probably worked with a thousand clients over 10 years, everything from a funeral home to a fertility clinic. So the entire spectrum of business across all of the ATO's 18 different tax categories. And what's different about this environment is the change hits now and every single business has a challenge where either what do I do when my pipeline's disappeared? How do I pivot and survive short term? Or what are my longer term opportunities in the new normal? So they're the sorts of things that businesses are, are sort of facing right now. Excellent, okay. Well, um... What I might ask you then, Ash, is um, why don't you share with us some of the principles that you've developed yourself from your understanding of your experiences that are really useful when 
planning, coping, and strategizing in a crisis? Yeah, great. So great question, Norman. And look, what we've attempted to do is on every single client interaction, we say, what can we systemize and scale? So I can't take credit for any of these principles because we're not really a, a, an original research house, but what we have done is distilled the principles that add value in those complex and uncertain times that people move in. And certainly that that switch between systems of simple systems, complicated, complex, and sometimes sort of chaotic uh, systems that we, we're sort of moving into. But probably the five things that we come back to and we coach our clients in, in terms of decision making in this time, is first of all, make sure it's strategic. So time, dollars and focus are scarce limited resources. How are we deciding on where to apply them for maximum leverage? So not just chicken or fish tactical, but really strategic uh, in, in the decision making. So the five principles are context, time, way, unwind and, and test. So they're the five things. So context says all strategy arises out of context. And when we look at our context, we need to figure out where we are right now and what we can control. So that's the most important thing to have a very good handle on context. Uh, then we, we talk about time, and I know you talk about this a lot, Norman, in terms of the scenario planning and, and, the, and the time uh, evolution of the longer the time horizon, the less certain we are, but the time's magical and it's where SWATs let us down. So play with time, and it's the Susie Welsh 10-10-10 principle that, that Warren Buffett uses that says that lets us look at the effect of time but also retain perspective of us as the decision maker of how we're going to feel, but also the effect of time on certain variables. So it forces us as we look at time to look at the trend lines. And I think that's really interesting as we move into an exponential world, what's moving gradually and then likely to go suddenly. And the data often tells that story when we have the discipline of looking at time. So we say context, and then we look at change context over time. The third thing is weighting it. And if there was one principle out of the five that just trumps all of them, comes out of the work of Oliver Saboni that, that leveraged the Armstrong decision-making framework. And what it says is a decision is just a prediction of the future. And maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong, but there's volatility in there. So any decision-making framework or principle is designed to have this level of uncertainty and compress it down and narrow it. And the best thing we can do, and, and Oliver said that, you know, it, having a system for decision making trumps people who just look at data by a factor of six. And the one factor that matter is compare to valid alternatives. Mm. And, the, and the key word in there is valid. So if I said, Norman, would you like a hundred dollars or a punch in the nose? One of those is clearly not valid. But if as a leader, you can ask your manager to have two valid alternatives. And even if the second valid alternative is putting your money in the bank, mm -hmm. that's at least valid and should be considered. So it comes from the understanding of the human brain is very poor at absolute analysis and also very prone. And you talk a lot about heuristic and biases, but to come away from the confirmation bias is when people have, you know, they decide right up front and then they spend all of the project time building a, a business case to prove they were right. Versus if you say, what are the two alternatives? And then we spend our time weighing them up. So that's the third one, probably the most important way. The fourth one I draw on the wisdom of Jeff Bezos and say, look, is this the nature of this decision a temporary decision where I can unwind it or is it permanent? and I'm going to have to live with those consequences in perpetuity. It relates a little bit to the time nature, but it really is very specific saying, if I make this, can I unwind it? <laughs> or if I make it, is it made? And the other analogy there is of the boat floating in the water. And you can play and put holes in the side of the boat that are above the waterline. And if you're wrong, you end up with a hole in the boat, but the boat's still going to float versus decisions that are below the waterline. And if you are wrong, the boat's going to be filling with water. And I think it's, it's a wonderful uh, analogy to play yeah. with. Yeah. Probably the fifth thing and the one I've been actively working with with my clients is to say, what are the tests? So within this decision, we make this decision. 
what are the assumptions that sit underneath it and how can I validate those as quickly as possible? So that's the first part around what can I test? Yeah. The second thing is tripwise. And I think you talk about this as well, Norman, if, you know, if the context changes, then would I need to review the decision? And the famous case study around that's obviously Kodak, who didn't not look at the market. They looked at the market in the 1980s and had, we're not going to go all in on digital because of these reasons. And their only mistake was they never put in the tripwires to reassess their core decision based on the supporting principles. So they're the five. Context, to make sure we're, we're very clear on the context of where we are. We're looking at the effect of time on those. We're weighing up a minimum of two alternatives. We check whether it's an unwind or a permanent decision, and then we've isolated to test and monitor their hypotheses. Great, thanks Ash. Um, and wouldn't you like to be on this desert island that he's on, um, although it's just a screensaver for him. He spends his life dreaming about where he could be rather than at work, <laughs> don't we all at the moment? So in the remaining time, there are just two more things I want to do. I want to talk about a very quick case study on some work that uh, we're currently doing at the moment with a science research organization over here called ESR. And then I want to share with you seven very practical takeaway principles, which you can actually put into place right now to improve your strategic thinking in a crisis. So if we um, just start over here and have a look at the first part, which is the ESR case study. ESR is a organization that does research and it provides services um, that are really benefiting communities and governments um, in this part of the world in three areas, environmental testing and water testing, Forensics, very important in crime and crime prevention and health. And as an organization with many, many scientists, which work in very expensive laboratories, and um, there's a huge wage bill and lots of time spent in developing new kind of research, which doesn't necessarily always pay off in the short term, they face a range of significant uncertainties, things like customer power. So governments and private enterprise that buys this research is demanding more and more in quicker and quicker time for less money. The second thing is that all these scientists who are busy doing research and publishing papers are in effect sharing information. So often information is produced here, which is used elsewhere, or it is produced in the USA or Europe or South Africa, and it is actually used in Australia or, or, um, or anywhere else. So there's a lot of sharing of data. So keeping IP closed is very difficult. And then, of course, thirdly, you've got massive technology change. So one of the things we tried to do was to really understand the future environment for science in Australasia. So what's science going to look like over here? And in order to do so, we had to really examine the major changes and uncertainties. And what we did is we identified that there were two key uncertainties which could not be predicted. The first, which is the um, vertical axis, the one standing up, is whether IP would continue to be held by experts in a, in a small tight group or whether IP would be widely available and easily accessible. And the second axis, the second key uncertainty was, in a sense, would the relationship with clients be transactional? So would they pay per service, per experiment, per result, which of course produces a, a fairly quick race to the bottom on fees, or would it be a strategic relationship with clients where partnerships and collaboration and strategic collaboration became the name, the name of the game? And we used that to construct four different scenarios. And you know, we gave them four quite creative names, which you see up there. So top right corner was private. Or sorry, I'll start in the top left. Top left corner is the restaurant. So the restaurant is generally a place where you go to because the chef or the cook is very good, but it's a very transactional relationship. Private dining is where the chef has a very good reputation and you actually buy the chef and they come and work for you and provide advice for you in a strategic way. They understand your needs and requirements and so on. Bottom right hand corner is, I guess, what we now know as Uber Eats. So they know you, they know your habits, they know your preferences from all the times you use them, but it's a very kind of open 
IP where you can choose from any number of restaurants that you want to buy from and you know they, they understand your requirements. And finally then on the bottom left is the night market. This is where the IP is very widely available and it is highly transactional and highly cost competitive. So in essence, what we did is we constructed the detail on those scenarios. And in effect, what we said is ESR faces four alternative futures. And it's really difficult if you take in a 10 year time horizon or even a five year time horizon as we were to predict which of those is really gonna dominate. So you have to prepare capabilities for all of them. And so what we did is, is we, 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 we identified the capabilities that would be required and we looked at those that would be common across all four scenarios. And these are the eight capabilities. And this becomes the action plan to build very strong external relationships. Now that sounds very obvious, but most of you, if you know a scientist would recognize that they don't really like going out and talking to people. They prefer standing in their laboratories and working alone. So this was a, a really important factor. We needed to develop um, opportunities to profitably exploit commercial opportunities. So that was a big thing. We, I'm just looking at some of the list of things here. We needed to provide intelligence for the community so that we, we, instead of actually coming after the event and saying, hey, by the way, the reason that everyone had gastroenteritis three months later, three months ago, was because we discovered some sheep poo in the water. No, you need to identify that quickly, get it out into the marketplace so people can start doing things about it. So, so these are the eight capabilities that have been developed in order to prepare ESR for the future. So that's a very quick run through on those case, on, on this particular case study. And obviously on the three-day program, we, we spend a lot more time going through how the process works and what you're likely to find from the process. I'm going to end our evening together um, before we answer some questions to talk about seven very practical things that you can do to enhance your strategic thinking. So the first thing I know we are really very conscious of, but don't often do as leaders in times of crisis is that we have to be honest about what we know and what we don't know, and just be completely open and transparent with our people. Because when you actually gaslight them, as the Americans like to say, when you, if I might use this term, bullshit them, they find out pretty quickly, you lose your credibility, all the motivation dies. And I think some of this is linked to this very traditional idea we have about leadership and strong leadership, because strong leaders know all the answers is the view. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just be vague. But actually it takes more courage and strength to say, hey, you know what? We don't know the answer to that question. We're still working on it. Do you have any opinions on it yourself? And being very open and being very transparent. The second approach, which is really important to use in an organization when you are facing a crisis is to identify very clearly at what stage you're at in the crisis. Are you in triage mode? Which means the boat is sinking, you're bleeding, you're losing sales, you're running out of business, your raw material supply has ended, your supply chain has collapsed, and we need to find out what's going on and fix it very quickly. Or are we in the process of reimagining what our new business model might look like for the future? And I dare say a number of organizations are probably doing this. Or are we finally in the phase of reinvention where we are building our new business model so that we are capable of delivering a new value proposition to customers. Now, one of the things we've learned and I've learned from working with companies and businesses and organizations, both profit and not-for-profit, is that generally speaking, the team that works on the triage, the team that works on what's the problem here, how do we fix it, how do we stop the bleeding, how do we keep our customers from leaving, has to be different from the team that does the reimagining of the new business model. And it makes a lot of sense to create a small team of people whose major task is to kind of look further out and do the reimagining. And then finally set up a team to do the reinvention. But trying to get everybody to do everything 
And I know you may find this difficult if you're a small organization, but you definitely need to separate, at least in your mind, if not in the behavior as well, the triage activities, which are really important to stop the bleeding from the reimagining of the new business model, and then finally its creation and reinvention. So identify where you are in a crisis. The next five are really very personal ones that I'm hoping you as an individual trying to think strategically about your situation might take into account. The third one we know is related to the way the brain likes to work. The brain does not like to be hurried and come up with creative ideas. It's like me saying to you, hurry up and relax. It, it, you can't do it. What you really need to do is to create a purposeful pause, even if that's only five seconds. And, and, and in your mind, create a decision point and say, well, I've got a few options here. Is this next thing the best thing that I could be doing? Now, that has two major benefits for us. The first is that by creating the pause, we give the brain a chance to reset. You know, the big thing that separates humans from animals is that we have the ability to pause between stimulus and reaction. Animals don't. So no matter how well your staffy or rocky or favorite dog is um, trained, if you pull your favorite dog's tail hard, it'll turn around and bite you because it doesn't have that ability to pause where you do. So you give your brain an opportunity to reset when you do that and to actually engage in at least a short amount of reflection. Because remember, making decisions quickly doesn't mean you have to make them reflexively. You know, but, but you know, if you're in a crisis and you have to make a decision quickly, it means an hour or two is fine, but take that hour, take the time to reflect. And the second reason we like to do this is because we give the brain a sense of control over its environment. We fool the brain to think that, actually, I have a choice here. Do I do this next thing? Is this gonna move me to my goal? And even if it's obvious that it is, by simply asking yourself, is this the right thing to do now? Will it really give me my best bang for the buck? You're giving yourself and your brain that sense of control. And that's a really comfortable place for the brain to operate in. The fourth thing that I like to encourage people to do is to use what's often called Napoleon's approach or what we call strategic insight. So there are four steps in creating strategic insight. The first is whenever you approach a crisis, whenever you approach or in a crisis, try to come at it with some understanding of the history. Figure out what has happened in other jurisdictions. Ask yourself what the theory is study the background. And once you've done that, then immerse yourself in the situation. Do not be an armchair general and view the battle from you know, a telescope on top of the hill. Go down and talk to the troops. Go and talk to the people at the front line. Speak to the customers. Ask them their opinions. And while you're doing that, a very difficult thing, but a very important thing to do is forget all that you know. In other words, don't prejudge the situation. Don't jump to conclusions. Just listen and immerse yourself in the situation. Then take the time to reflect. Step back. You know, as uh, Heifetz says, move away from the dance floor onto the balcony and look down on the balcony as if you were an external observer. Leave the noise, leave the data, leave the information and retreat from the situation to reflect and then wait for the insight. And once the insight arrives, act with conviction. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is you can't actually tell when the insight will occur. All you can do is create the necessary preconditions for that insight. Fifthly, use multiple perspectives, several mental models, make sure that you actually use different approaches. So if you've got a problem, ask your accountant, ask the HR person, ask the marketing person, ask the operations person, get those different mental models, try different points of view, because you'll find that often it's a combination of one or two and one insight informs another insight. The one that uh, I like as well is one that Ashton mentioned in his video, and that is strategy used by Warren Buffett. And he's saying, whenever you are faced with a truly difficult decision in a crisis or in a difficult situation, 
Ask yourself, if I make this decision now, how will I feel about that in 10 days? How will I feel about the decision in 10 months? And what about in 10 years' time? And it, it, this whole thing of changing your time horizon is a great way of testing the validity of your particular decision. So sometimes it may, not, it may be 10 minutes, 10 hours, and 10 days, you know, but shift your time horizon and give yourself a perspective of how you might think about this over time. And the last thing I want to mention is, to me, the most important things you can remember in a crisis. Be calm, be open, and be inclusive. Keep yourself open-minded, ask lots of opinions, and don't rush reflexively into any particular decision. So if you'd like to hear more about this, you'd like to find out more about these ideas and approaches, Gibbs is running, we're running a scenario planning and strategic thinking program from the 2nd to 5th of June. It's likely that this is going to be run on an, in, on an online basis, but who knows, you know, the world may change and they may actually let people travel, in which case I would love to grace your beautiful shores and actually do it on campus. However, we are making provisions to run this online as well. Okay, at this point in time, I'm going to pause and I'm going to open up the Q&A, <coughs> the questions, and I'm going to see if I can answer some of those questions that you've asked. So I see two from what, one's from Avin. I'm going to try and answer that live. Avin writes, if not our time is spent for deep diving into insights, is there a role for tech like big data to make this process less onerous? Assuming, of course, it's a phase that is seen as taking too much time. I mean, this is a really important issue here. You know, one of the myths of decision making that I like to talk about is that experts know best. It's a myth because experts are often the most inconsistent, the most forgetful, and they make the most mistakes in applying their own guidelines. So absolutely is the answer to your question. So one of the things that we find very, very valuable is if you do have access to experts, identify what those guidelines are. Think cancer for the moment. Assemble the team of top oncologists in the world and use those guidelines for diagnosing tumors. Then feed that into artificial intelligence or an algorithm. And you'll find that that algorithm or artificial intelligence makes the decision far more consistently and far more accurately because experts themselves do not follow their own guidelines very often. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you've had to seek expert guidelines from other people, try and get more, more than one expert to give you advice and then look for the pattern between those experts because unlikely that they will all agree and then make your decision. Um, the second question is, what are the free sources of information are available in order to continue this this journey of strategic thinking? Well, um, the, the one I would really recommend is, is, of course, the Gibbs course on the 2nd to 5th of June. Um, we, we run a three-day program. There'll be huge amounts of data and, uh, and resources, uh, uh, articles and writing and, uh, and opportunities to discuss this question. Um, so there's a lot. If you would like to uh, contact me directly, then do it through Katie Kilpatrick or one of the folk at Gibbs and they'll pass it on to me and I'll be more than happy to answer those questions and provide that information to you. Um, Angel has asked a question. She said, for cut through marketing, we need a single minded consistent brand image. As an executive search firm, how do we plan for multiple scenarios with different product offerings without a communication seeming inconsistent? Well, Angel, I think this is not a, um, an easy question to answer, but the, the thing that I'd say right up front is that while you might have an overall position in the marketplace as an exec search firm, you might have different messages and different offerings to different segments of the market. For example, if you were actually trying to promote your business in a high tech environment, um, I'd imagine that your messaging and the way you actually communicate there would have to be somewhat different because your value proposition is gonna to have to match the needs. So 
I think this whole idea about single-minded consistent brand message is fine for the brand positioning overall, but I think your specific marketing communication would really need to take into account what value proposition is required in that market segment and then speak directly to that market segment. Sambulo asks, what would you say about the role of how you treat people as part of a decision making a crisis? How important is engagement with your people? Excellent question. I think one of the things that we're seeing from businesses that actually run um, quite successful crisis management is that they generally separate the strategic decisions and the operational decisions. So what they do is they create a crisis center or a nerve center for the strategic decisions and they only address the really big strategic decisions. What's important though is who you invite to that nerve center. It doesn't necessarily only have to be the senior members of the team. What it needs to be is a group of people, seven to nine maximum, who have the ability to actually challenge the thinking. People who've actually been through tough situations, people who are actually prepared to pass bad news up to senior management, even though it's unpopular, and people perhaps who've actually been through personal crises themselves. In terms of the um, operational decisions, empower the operational people, the ones that really know what they're doing and leave that to them. So the triage gets handled by them and you do the strategic thinking in a nerve center. Um, I'm just looking for a sign from the organizers as to how much longer I go. Um, but um, Chris Darby asks, is there any good books? Yes, I would recommend a really interesting book by William Duggan. William Duggan, D-U-G-G-A-N. Um, William Duggan's book is called Strategic Intuition. The other book I would recommend is, um, is um, uh, the book by Dan Ariely called um, People Are Unpredictably, sorry, People Are Predictably Irrational, Predictable un Irrationality. Um, I think I've just got the title wrong. It's sitting right behind me now, but it's called um, Predictably Irrational. That's what it's called, Predictably Irrational. It's based on behavioral economics, and, uh, and I'd suggest that was a really good book and very readable. Um, do I see multiple futures unfolding? What are those futures? Mate, if I knew the answer to that one, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be a millionaire at the moment. Look, unfortunately, Christo, that kind of uh, work can only be done within a specific context. Um, and so, for example, the work that I did with ESR was done within the context of science. Um, I've just done a project on the national forests of New Zealand, and that was done over a 30 year time frame. And that was done within the context of um, the resources sector and hardware and, uh, and timber and uh, building products and so on. So you've got to do it within the context of a specific sector. And the reason for that is that when you do your environmental scan, you've really got to focus on information which is relevant to your particular problem. So for example, you know, if you're sitting here at the moment and you're trying to look at uh, um, the future of IT in, in telecommunications within South Africa, the fact that there might be swine flu in China, which is killing 50% of their pig population is probably interesting, but not relevant to your particular situation. So, the idea of being able to identify global scenarios which apply across the board. And I know that Maria Suestesen at, uh, at Gibbs has done some, some really good work within the South African context, within the South African socio-political and economic context, which is very useful. So that's probably a better way to go and maybe a better person to ask, but it has to be applied to a specific, um, to a specific context. Um, Camiso, currently honesty and openness in leadership has been tossed out in favor of denial, denial and truth bending in leadership. Is this a long term in our society or will honesty and truth eventually prevail? <laughs> hey, I wish I knew the answer. Look, I think that there's been a global shift towards more right wing 
type of regimes. And as a result, I think that what we see is that the rule of law has been um, has given way to a more authoritarian and, and, and sort of almost dictatorial approach. Um, and th that has actually been about truth bending. I don't believe that this can continue because I think that the harder you press down on a people, the harder they push back. So eventually, whether you're talking about Australia, whether you're talking about China, whether you're talking about South Africa, whether you're talking about the USA, um, you know, so, sometimes this will happen. And unfortunately, at times of crisis, you do need very strong centralized control for those strategic decisions. The trick, though, and this is a big trick, is letting go after the crisis is over and not holding on to those highly centralized controls. Um, I think we probably need to draw this to a close. I'm going to look for a signal from Katie um, as to whether I can go on. Thanks, but I Norman. See that... Yeah, yeah we, we, we're running out of time. So I thank Good. you that you've uh, answered so many for us. But uh, yeah, it's time to wrap. All right, thank you very much indeed, folks. Um, really appreciate your time. Hope that's been helpful. Perhaps I'll ask Katie that if you um, continue to put your Q&A up um, and she sends those to me, I will send some responses directly back to her and those can be disseminated as part of the material sent out by Gibbs. So thank you very much for your time. Best luck as you navigate COVID-19 and enjoy, uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. For me, it's time for my whiskey and bed. Thank you very much. Good night. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.